lots of martial artists like weapons. Um, I have never met anyone who is as comprehensively obsessed with swords as uh, Six Wetzler, who is, uh, he has a PhD in, uh, is it's, it's like old Norse, Scandinavian, Norse literature and martial arts, and uh, is now, I think his plan is to own and become synonymous with and to embody <laughs> The, um, the German Blade Museum in Solingen. So, Dr. Six Wetzler, how are you doing? I'm fine. Thank you, Paul, for inviting me. How are you? I I'm good, yeah. I'm, I'm wearing the T-shirt you gave me. Yes! Uh, the Super training, nice! Yeah. Training Super diagram nice. T-shirt. Yes, the <laughs> geometry of the fighting, very good. <laughs> yeah, that's a hell of a diagram, isn't it? <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah. It is, it is. So, yeah, it's good to see you. So, um, we've met, we've met maybe a dozen times, maybe a little bit less. We've yeah. worked together on different projects. You came to, you, you've come, been to almost all of uh, the martial arts studies conferences and you've published in the martial arts studies journal and you are an all round um, mar martial arts enthusiast on every single level, yes. is that right? That's true. <laughs> That's the definition I'd say, yeah. So shall we, shall we start with swords? I yeah. mean, I mean, I've never, I, I, a lot of people. I, I like also, I also yeah. have my my Saudi T-shirt, especially for today. So That's the next T-shirt I want. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you you kind of quit academia. You didn't quit academia. I mean, you can't be a museum curator and, and and not be an academic. But you went through academia. You got your PhD, and you took a temporary job in the in the Blade Museum in yeah. the Knife Museum and. And you realized that this was your perfect environment. Is that right? Yeah, that's that's more or less it. I was um, still working on my PhD um, when a friend approached me, uh, an archaeologist from Freiburg, where I come from, uh, Lisa Deutscher, and she had the brilliant idea um, to host a conference on sorts, um, which we did then in 2012, together with uh, two other archaeologists from Freiburg, um, Miriam Kaiser and Marius Michel. Um, and we started a conference there. Um, so that was in 2012. And that kind of set the path. Um, I've been a knife and blade enthusiast for a long time. And um, I'm, I'm a good friend of Peter Jonsson, who is one of the most renowned swordsmiths uh, for modern swords. Um, so via this conference and my connection to Peter Jonsson, I some way ended up here at uh, Deutsches Klingen Museum in 2013 to start and prepare a huge exhibition on medieval European swords, which was hosted in 2015. Um, and then at the beginning, I was working here as a freelancer, and then I got just very, very lucky, or maybe it was fate. <laughs> so in 2016, the current job where I'm on now, the deputy or assistant director of the museum, um, became free and I applied and I got the job and now I'm here. And you, this is better for you than a university job because you're surrounded by swords? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yeah. No, really, it is, for the one hand, it is about the, the object. Yeah? I like being in touch with the physicality of things. Mm -hmm. um, and then on the other hand, I've been in academia for, for a long time. Um, I, I started, oh, I, I taught classes at the university um, as well, beginner's classes. Um, but I like being at a museum because there are so many levels. Yeah? Now I'm having a Zoom meeting with a, with a distinguished professor in the UK. Um, and uh, when the corona is over, I'll start to teach uh, sword fighting classes for school kids again. Mm -hmm. uh, I organize an exhibition. So there are so many different levels. And I think academia, um, like, proper academia can hardly provide all these various aspects. Yeah. I like the, the flexibility of the job that, when, that I'm doing. Yeah, and, but you still, you still closely connect with research and you still publish yes. articles and collections and, and yeah. all kinds of things, yeah? Yeah, yeah. It is according to the, to the um, definition, international definition of the museum, one of the five main goals, um, jobs of a museum is to, re to do research. Mm -hmm. So this is this is obviously part of part of my job, and also even part of my job description that I'm supposed to do research on the objects that we have and their historical context. Okay. <laughs> Just sharing a screen there of um, <laughs> some pictures of Six Wetzler, and here we have uh, on the right there's uh, your Pakiti Tersia Kali yeah. seminars, 
and then there's you holding various weapons and sniper yeah. looking cheeky there. Oh, yeah. Um, so tell me the, your relationship with Pakiti Tercia. I mean, which came first, your interest in swords or your interest in... I mean, how did you find Pakiti Tercia of all things? It doesn't, it's not a mainstream thing, certainly not in the UK. Yeah, it's not a, it's not a, not a mainstream thing. Um, I started uh, training in martial arts 30 years ago. Um, I was fascinated with martial arts uh, since I was like nine years old, at least. When I watched the, the 36th Chamber of the Shaolin for the first time, that was my like epiphany moment in my life. Um, and all, also I was fascinated with, with swords and knives and blades for as long as I can remember. Um, so I studied various martial arts. I started in Chotokan Karate. And then when I moved to Tübingen um, to study, um, I checked what kind of martial arts are there, what could I train. And I had a little bit of exposition to Filipino martial arts before. And I wa always was super interested because I was interested, of course, in the blade work, but also the, the stick and like the open self-defense approach mm -hmm. um, of the Filipino martial arts. And then I heard that there's the Pekita Tersha group in uh, Reutlingen which is only like 10 kilometers from Tübingen. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Uli Weidler um, was the head teacher for the system for Europe, was teaching there. And I uh, said, well, let's give it a try. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I was still doing um, full contact karate, Enshin karate and, and Muay Thai. So for a couple of years, I trained both. Mm -hmm. um, and then I decided to go, yeah, to, to quit my uh, sports career and go head on into the, the back to Tesha and concept. And was that because um, you, you were more interested in the breadth of the syllabus and, and the range of the kind of approaches or, or just because you weren't that motivated by competition or? Um, both, both. Um, back to Tesha, when I, when I saw it first, was like the answer uh, for me, the thing that I had always been looking for in martial arts since I was that nine-year-old boy watching the Shaolin monks. Um, so this was what I wanted. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, I love the ancient karate and I love the, the sporty fighting and I took part in various, various tournaments and, and uh, full contact fights. Um, but this is um, something that you can do only so long. Yeah? And it started to wear down on my, on my body. So I had like after one tournament, I was for two weeks, every morning I woke up, my, my legs were, were numb from the low kicks that I got in the tournament. And I thought, yeah, well, maybe that's not <laughs> perspective for the rest of my life to do that. Um, and so both these, these reasons, the, the fascination for the Filipino martial arts and the understanding that I will not be a, like a professional sports mm. MMA or Muay Thai fighter, uh, led me to the decision to go into, into Pekit mm -hmm. And you, um, was the, so, so was the, the conference at the, at the, at Solingen, um, the, the Deutsches Klingen Museum, was that, your, that was the, the start of your interest in, in the relationship between martial arts and, and academic work. And then, it, then there was a conference, was it organized by Peter Kuhn? That was a, a, yeah. a, the first of the German yeah. uh, martial arts studies yeah. kind of conferences. Yeah. When, was, yeah, when was that one, the first? It was in 2011. Okay. 2011. Peter Kuhn organized the first um, German conference on Kampfsport und Kampfkunst in yeah. wissenschaftlicher Perspektive, martial arts studies. Uh, in English um, at the University of Bayreuth. And this was for us in Germany, this was the starting point. So a huge part of the crowd that is still there and working on the topics were, were there back then already. Yeah. So they were all like, lots of these people who are now professors, they, they were, they were yeah. students yeah. then, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we've, we've come a long way. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's I remember the, the first conference that I held in, in Cardiff and it was almost like the people came from all over the place, from all over the world. And a huge like coach load of people came from Germany. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's like, we have to go there. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. In 2000, uh, your first conference was in 2015, 15, wasn't it? 15, I think, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and by then we already had the, also the organizational structure. By then we had become an official committee within the German uh, Society for Sports uh, Studies. Um, so there was also the infrastructure and we communicated before and like, hey, let's go there. It looks super interesting. Yeah, yeah. it was it was it was good. And it was it's it was great to get kind of hooked up with the with the German network because it's so very uh, it was very established, very organized, very connected, funded as well, which is like, I mean, how the hell does that happen? But in Germany, they don't do things unless they're funded. Right. You just you know, you do a conference if it's funded. Um, 
uh, yes, depending <laughs> <laughs> depending on which level in academia you are. So okay. uh, sometimes um, you just do it for the fun of it. You don't have money, but usually you would say, okay, we need we need some some backup for that. And are you still are you still on that committee on the DVS committee or? Uh, yeah, I'm still still working with them. But um, honestly, I have to admit, um, at the moment I have so many things going on at, at the museum that I have to to con concentrate more on what's what's going on here. So I do not give as much input at the moment as I would wish or as would be good. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I hope that will change also in the next years. Mm -hmm. And you are also the author of uh, uh, a very widely cited, very widely referred to article that was in, I think, issue two of Martial Arts Studies. And it was called, uh, it might have been called Martial Arts Studies as Culture of Wissenschaft. Yes. Um, yes. And uh, it's been hugely influential, I think, yeah. not influential enough to, to my mind, <laughs> in which, could you tell us a little bit about your argument in, in that article? Um, the article uh, rose from the, the age-old definition, definition question <laughs> that you also have been uh, talking, have been writing about a lot. And um, when I approach martial arts studies, uh, I bring in the background, uh, my academic background, how I was trained in Tübingen. I did my PhD in Scandinavian studies, but my main subject while I was studying and also my master thesis was in history of religion in mm. Tübingen, um, which has a special approach. The Tübingen school was very strong, and especially my professor, Burkhard Gladigo, um, who is just a genius. And he influenced me tremendously in my way of thinking in general and also my, my academic thinking and i was i was wondering how could i how could i apply the methods and the way of thinking that i learned from professor gladigo how could i apply that to martial arts studies um, and um, he had a, a very um, clear and crisp way to understand systems and put perspectives how can we describe systems not definition in that way, um, but um, to, uh, trying to get an angle uh, on a phenomenon that otherwise is too fluid to be described. And I try to transfer these methods from the history of religion of the Tübingen School to martial arts studies. Um, mm -hmm. And this is and then... You come up with a kind of, it's, to me, it, it, it's almost like a Venn diagram approach, isn't it? Of, 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 of the, if the, if the, if the, if the, the universal set is martial arts, you have an you have an image of there's different overlapping and interlocking yeah. meanings, values, social functions, psychological functions, yeah. uh, some of which are and you suggest there's probably about five main ones. Yeah, I thought at that point I thought there are five main ones. Um, now my own thinking and the discussions with many people have brought me there might be others as well, and then I wonder whether they are like. Um, super or under categories that I should put next to my five categories or I should above them or below them. Um, so the categories that I described were preparation for violence, uh, sports, uh, combat, uh, performative action, uh, transcendent goals and healthcare. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I said already when I described that, that this is not a definite list, there are only these five, but these were the most dominant that came to my mind. Yeah. And now uh, our friend Ben Judkins, for example, oh, already two years ago, has pointed out, yeah, what about economy? Yeah, there is clearly, and there has been for hundreds of years, an economic dimension to martial arts. Martial arts are something that is sold. Yeah. Um, but this, then I wonder, might be an uh, um, under category or super category, because any of these five other categories can be something that you sell. You sell martial arts as self-defense, preparation for violence. You yeah. sell it as healthcare. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these, then the, the, the economic category, for example, interconnects. Yeah. Yes. Uh, the same for the creation of, of uh, social unity, of creating groups. This is yeah. obviously super important. Again, something that Ben Judkins probably m made me aware of the strongest in his, in his book together with Nielsen on the history of Wing Chun, yeah? how important this community building is in martial arts. And again, this can be superimposed on all these other categories, I think. Yeah, I guess, I, th I wonder if, I think my, 
because I, I really liked it and I like the clarity that you offered to, to, to like, we don't define it. We, we've got a term that we currently use and like we, when we look at it now, we can see all of these different shifting functions and we can look at it through a historical lens and go, uh, different martial arts have changed their status over time and, and what may once have been approach, approach for self-defense or preparation for violence now becomes more spiritual or for health yeah. matters or, or, or whatever. But I guess, my question was was about um, it seemed a little bit too formalistic. It still mm -hmm. seemed a little bit too like a snapshot, like like we can look now and apply the lenses and concerns of our times now back and map out you know changing states. but really there's a a bit too much. I thought perhaps still a little bit too much kind of projection in mm -hmm. the sense of projecting a neatness onto the world. That was mm. my argument, my response to you was always, it's, it's more messy than that. It, 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 what you're saying is helpful, but, but it's still got to, it still feels more complicated than that. Mm. It is absolutely more complicated. I mean, any, um, this is not a model that I propose, it's a tool set. Uh, it, is, it is just various lenses through which you could look, uh, look at martial arts. Uh, um, and sometimes some of these five dimensions, I think, are forgotten when we talk about uh, any given martial arts. Um, and this just, I just wanted to remind that there's always more to it than what it seems. Yeah. Um, even if you look at, uh, for example, Shotokan Karate, which is one of the most widespread styles over the world, I guess, at least definitely in, in Germany. Um, so what is this? Yeah. If you look at a homepage, um, then usually they would, they would tell you it's about fitness, it's about self-defense, it's mm. about self-development. What is it for the in individual? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it also about healthcare? For example? Oh, yes, now that you ask, yeah, I'm actually doing it to become fit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so these, these categories should be just tools, reminders, what you can ask of a, of a martial art. Yeah. They, are, they are no description of that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's just questions that you should raise, I think, when you talk about martial arts, and especially, I think, in the historical dimension. You know? For example, if we talk about economy, one of these other categories that I, at some point, have to include into my system. Um, if you ask modern martial artists, um, or if you look at internet boards, there's, there's often this notion, yeah, in the olden days, it was all about like true fighting, yeah, but nowadays, people sell off their martial arts. Yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But then you, then you look at the history um, of, for example, Chinese martial arts or European martial arts. Uh, you know, in the Middle Ages, people were selling these martial arts yeah, yeah. naturally because it was a skill that they had. So very often you can correct modern notions by asking these questions in a historical perspective. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is extremely important because I see again and again, and since 2011, I have seen that how practitioners' views spill over into martial arts studies. Yeah. Because people who are doing martial arts studies, they have been trained probably in one martial art. They have been doing this for a couple of years and they internalize the myths that these martial arts are telling about themselves. And then they bring it unquestioned into martial arts studies. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then they raise, they raise secondary questions that would not need to be raised if you ask the proper first question, I think. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, there's problems of epistemology and mythology uh, kind of seeping into everything. I mean, you um, once sort of reprimanded me in a, in a review that you wrote saying like, whenever Bowman uses the term martial arts, he always implicitly means uh, East Asian martial arts. Absolutely, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. But I mean, I, 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 I thought about that a lot and yeah, and I, and I, and I did and I didn't fully in interrogate that but I have since and I still think I would stand by it I think when I with a lot of caveats and a lot of qualifications I would still say the term martial arts is overdetermined and heavily implies yeah. East Asian martial arts and that's despite HEMA yeah. historical yeah. European martial arts it's despite Brazilian jiu-jitsu yeah. and capoeira yeah. and all of the, 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 the uh, all of the African martial arts and all of the, yeah. the, the indigenous martial arts that, that, that um, we all now know about, we know more and more mm -hmm. about, like almost every culture surely has mm -hmm. something yeah. that could fall into that category. Yeah. But I think that the term martial arts emerged as a term 
really in the 1970s yeah. in response to the kind of films that you and I loved when we were, when yeah. we were children. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you. And I think that shows our different perspective because um, uh, your perspective then is the, the term martial arts is heavily overloaded, uh, leaning towards the Asian martial arts side in general popular discourse. If you ask anyone on the street, what is martial arts? Yeah, it's like in, when they do in China, absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. And um, when I use it, when I want to use it in martial arts studies, as, that, as I see it, I want to, to use it um, as a descriptive, as an academic term yeah. um, that, is, that is aiming to um, include the worldwide phenomenon. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Once again, this is my background is my training in, in uh, history of religion, Burkhard Gladigo. Yeah? Somebody wrote about Gladigo and he meant it positively at one point. In Gladigo's perspective, um, the history of religion becomes a history of ideology. Mm -hmm. yeah? So if I would have asked um, Professor Gladigo, well, could I, could I uh, write my master thesis about um, Stalinism as a religious system? He would, yeah, of course, just do it. Yeah? If you were to ask anyone on the street, what is religion? They would say, yeah, it's, it's Christendom and it's Islam and it's mm -hmm. Buddhism. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So the, the academic term must not necessarily correlate to, to, the, to the use of the word in, in general discourse. Yeah. I think. Yeah. So and both is fine, both is, both is fine. As I say, this is, this is a different perspective, I think that, that you and I are having, and it's just important that we, that we make clear what we are talking about. Yeah, I think it's, I mean, I implicitly agree with, with that displacement. So the conference that we were meant to be having in Marseille in July, which has been cancelled or postponed or will we'll change form mm -hmm. into maybe an online format because of the, the pandemic. <clears throat> we were, I think we were both preparing to give papers that really treated um, the question of martial arts and religion in terms of the question of ideology, or, or if not ideology, belief yeah. Like, and trust and faith, yeah. you know, you, you, when you walk into a, uh, a club or when you fantasize about a club, like when you're looking for a, a, the answer to something and there's all those different dimensions, like you, you, you engage in a practice and you start to believe in it. Like yeah. you believe that the movements you are doing will be effective. They are yeah. real uh, and, and they actually exist. And you believe in the historical founders and the myths and the legends, but you don't even need to believe in the myths and the legends to still believe in your, yeah. in your practice. So, I mean, I argued in the organization of that conference that there should be a lot more emphasis on the word belief, yeah. but my co-organizers, they were more interested in religions, yeah. kind of anthropological sense. Yeah. I mean, are we talking about belief here, like faith? like faith in Stalin, faith in Wing Chun, faith in, yeah. in Shotokan or... Yeah, uh, we are also talking about that, uh, I guess. Yeah? Mm -hmm. this, is, uh, this is something that, that we once addressed when we're talking about mythologies of martial arts. So mm -hmm. what narratives have to be developed to make people believe that what they are doing is actually true, meaning that it will develop the skill set that they want to have in the first place. So it is about belief, about trust in something and about how to instill that trust in the practitioners. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, for me, when I talk about martial arts and religion, about how martial arts could work as, and all these terms are super complicated, substitute religions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that I was laughing about when, when the, the uh, call for papers came out for the Marseille conference, um, at first it was like, fantastic, I'm really looking forward to that. And, mm -hmm. It's a great pity that it cannot take place. Um, but also I found it kind of funny because we have that super problematic term of martial arts on the one hand, on the one yeah. side. Yeah, and we do not, nobody can define what it is or wants to define what it is. And on the other hand, we have the super, super, super problematic term of religion. Yeah. yeah. And there's, there's this famous thing, somebody in the history of religion counted once how many definitions, academic definitions are out there. Yeah. Um, that are widely cited for what a religion is. And he counted like 153 or something. Yeah. Um, and not one of them is generally agreed upon. And now we bring these two super complicated concepts together to see how they interact. <laughs> so this and will be fun. added to that was the term spirituality. So the title was martial arts, religion, and spirituality. Yeah, fantastic. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know what spirituality is. Like yeah. you know, it's it's it seems to be a sort of massive area of gullibility in the place of yeah. formal religion. That seems to be. Yeah. 
what spirituality yeah. is, but yeah. oh, I don't know. Yeah. So it was going to be, it was going to be a very um, lively. Uh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But um, I mean, this is um, this is the the um, uh, Lukman um, shrinking transcendence, expanding religion is the important article um, or essay in the history of religion. Where he where he states that um, we have a we live in a, in a in a change of religious life of people and the transcendences are are shrinking. Yeah? What he means is that the 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 opposite the religious opposite that you adhere to like God hmm. paradise they become less and less. Um, but therefore, religion can be everything like personal development, betterment, hmm. political con concepts like democracy. He thinks that, or spirituality, that these ideologies fulfill roles that before were fulfilled by one common um, universal other higher than human being. Yeah. And I think that you could, you could apply that very well to, to martial arts studies when talking about or thinking about martial arts as, again, substitute, I don't like the term, but substitute religions, just to shorten yeah, there was a, I, I remember a quote from the, um, the novelist Martin Amis who said, um, the problem with the death of God is not that people believe in nothing, but that they'll now believe in anything. Yeah, <laughs> that's, it's brilliant. It's, there's a, oh, brilliant, brilliant yeah. quote. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's more or less exactly what in that yeah. thinking transcend, but um, um, put a little bit, a little bit nicer. Yeah. So tell us now about your, um, that your PhD and your studies in Scandinavian mm. literature, Scandinavian studies. Tell me, tell me, tell us what you did there. Mm. Um, I originally I'm specialized um, with this connection of Scandinavian studies, history of religion, and medieval history that I also studied. Um, I was concentrating on the history of pre and peri Christian Germanic religion, Germanic mm. heathendom, so to say, um, and. After my master thesis, I got a huge crisis uh, in academia and I was like, oh, all this humanity is bullshit. Who needs that? <laughs> and didn't want to do that anymore. So I studied sports for a while at the university, but I quit that again because I felt too old at that point. Um, and I was away um, from university for a while. And then at some point when I was in Iceland, I thought, why do not, uh, don't I bring together um, the two things that really matter in my life, the two things I'm doing, which is my academic training and my martial arts background. Uh, mm -hmm. And then I proposed to my professor, Professor uh, Wirt from Tübingen, um, couldn't I do a PhD in Scandinavian studies on how combat and fighting is described in medieval Icelandic literature. Uh, and I'm very thankful for her uh, too, because she said, yeah, that's cool. Mm -hmm. Let's do it. Uh, and then I did it. <laughs> and what, so this was an understudied, this, people hadn't been studying the description of, of combat in, in this literature or, yep. or had people, but they didn't know enough about combat or what was your, what was your unique line on this? Yeah, for a weird reason, it was really understudied. Uh, so you find the odd comments on the combat scenes here and there um, in uh, academic literature on Old Norse, but it was never or very seldomly, like thoroughly, completely researched. Um, and this is really weird because combat scenes play such a huge role in medieval Icelandic literature, especially in the saga of Icelanders, yeah. um, the things that people do read when they read Old Norse literature, modern yeah. translation. Um, so these are basically like, like Wild West films. Yeah? The one guy steals the cattle of another guy, then they go over there and burn down his house, then they come and kill his brother, stuff like yeah. that. So there's fighting going on all the time. Yeah? Yeah. And the fight scenes are extremely important because they also they are used by the authors to reflect on the characters and on the general dynamics of the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it was weird that it never had been studied, um, probably because it was too far away of everyday life of the academics, mm. or because it's it's a touchy topic because uh, this is this below us all this yeah, violence. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know why, but it, it's really interesting once once you start to look at it. So what what are the main uh, I guess the main types of combat we see. What are the main weapons? I mean, what, is there a, is there are there is there a dominant form of combat that that the the literature prefers, or mm -hmm. do you see all different types of combat of events? You feel, you see all different types. You see all different types because 
Um, Old Norse literature is extremely rich uh, and is di divided into several subgenres, and these subgenres can can even shift within one story. Uh, and when they shift, they start to describe fights differently. Yeah? It is um, comparable with modern modern cinema. When you when you um, watch Ong Bak or The Raid, a fight would look differently than when you have just a, a fist fight in a in a thriller or, or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So fighting can be aestheticized, um, it can be exaggerated, uh, it can be very brief and violent. And Old Norse literature has the option to use all these different ways to describe fighting. So there is not one. Uh, there, there are several. Yeah. And what do we, can we make any um, connections with a, a reality outside the text? I mean, is there a, 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 a there are different genres and different ways of describing it, fighting and different ways of staging fighting scenes in the, in the various literatures then, I mean, are there any that you could say, actually this, we could call this realism. Yeah. Is there anything there that we could call yeah. realism? Yeah. yeah, there are. There was my basic interest, my basic research, quest, research question was that um, we have the fight books from um, medieval Europe. Mm -hmm. um, Daniel Jacquet, my friend, was talking with you about, about these, these books too, um, which describe fighting uh, techniques, but we do not have anything from, like that from Iceland. And I was wondering, can we deduce from the literature, if it is so rich in combat scenes, can we deduce whether these people had actual combat training, whether they had something like a fencing culture? So is there realism in the, in the combat scenes? Yeah. And to be able to do this, First, you have to understand the literary dimension mm -hmm. of the combat scenes. This is something that is often not done when, when hobbyists um, approach these, these sagas. Yeah? All of them are translated into English, yeah? so you can just read them and look them up. And then without any understanding of the historical context of the super complicated literary history, you would just go like, ah, oh, so the Vikings fought like this uh, because it's in here. This obviously doesn't work. Yeah? It is mm -hmm. the same as if you would want to to deduce uh, the combat methods of Northern American uh, native plain uh, people of the 19th century from Wild West movies of the 20, uh, 20th century. Yeah. So ah. you have, to, you have to, to, to sift out all the, um, the other information. Yeah? Yeah. And then probably there's a core of realism. And yes, there is. There is so, but there's also a, a core of political realism in the modern context where you get people who are invested for various either fantasy or ideological reasons in reconstructing uh, or attempting to reconstruct a version of their kind of Nordic past and yeah. they, go, they read the, the uh, English translation of or watch the film <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they watch Beowulf or something and go right so, so I've got blonde hair, so I must be a Viking, yeah. right? And, yeah. and I'm going to buy a sword and a hammer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so, so I mean, that, it circulates in a complex discourse, doesn't it? Where yeah. people believe they project and invest in, in these texts in different yeah. ways, that some of which are really dubious. Yeah, uh, absolutely, absolutely. This is, I mean, this is a, a problem of martial arts in general, I think, that is often tied to ideas of, of nationality, of, of race, of, identity, uh, our martial art, usually our martial art, whichever that is, is the best. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it has been practiced by us for 2000 years and it has not been adulterated by combination with other martial arts, which is always crap. Yeah? But yeah, everybody yeah. tells that about their own martial arts. And if you don't have your own martial art, then you need to find it in some historic documents. Yeah. Yeah? And then you need to, to reconstruct it. I mean, there's this, this movie, uh, Reclaiming the Blade, about the HEMA scene, it's a couple of years old. And there you have, I don't know who that was, but you have a, a Swedish HEMA is um, saying, yeah, I'm, I'm not so much interested in studying Japanese sword because I want to train what my forefathers did. Well, mm -hmm. you're a Swedish guy of the 20th, 20th century, but you're, you're training German and Italian sword fighting methods of the 14th, 15th century. So this is not exactly your forefathers. Why are these people closer to you than modern day Japanese? Yeah, I don't get it, but obviously this is about identity constru uh, construction. Yeah, and what do you? I mean, what do you, as a as a as a museum curator and someone a curator of exhibitions and so on? I mean, what what's your take on the relationship between the historic artifacts and contemporary cultural identity? What's the, mm. what's the good way of doing this, and what's the bad way of doing mm. this? 
Mm. I try I try to show people the the width um, of, for example, a phenomenon like like martial arts. Yeah, that um, probably this is also why why I'm so against this this connection between martial arts and Asia. Martial arts are only Asian. Um, I would have the same problem if somebody said martial arts are only African or they're only European or anything. It's a general phenomenon, and I think it always helps to show people. Um, that that mankind on various places at various times wasn't stupid. Yeah. So these people had good ideas and they, they developed methods to deal with their everyday life. And usually these mm -hmm. methods are quite good. Yeah. We have this question, for example, just we have this question about swords all the time. So the best sword for a long, long time, of course, was the Japanese sword. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what everybody believed. And then the pendulum shifted and nowadays maybe many people would say yeah but the european swords the european long sword is actually much better than the katana yeah mm -hmm. and the whole question what is the best i think this is the problem because you have fantastic swordsmiths uh from portugal mm -hmm. to tokyo <laughs> and from from finland down to south africa so there's there's blades everywhere and these people were good in producing them and as a museum as a museum curator i try to show people that that uh humans various places were extremely skillful yeah, yeah. i was going to say something then but I, I've, I've lost it because that that <laughs> that that question was so interesting i th there's there's something else that <laughs> i always remember but there, there's several things that you that you have said to me mm. that just always pop into my head like uh, <laughs> just, almost every day sometimes maybe like it was hit harder <laughs> <laughs> yeah be lava but um <laughs> the, the the first thing that you said that stuck in my head was that the, the first time i met you and you said why did you have this conference because uh, it used to be the case that an academic interest in martial arts was career suicide so i always <laughs> think of the term as career suicide that, that. and then the other thing is, is a comment that you wrote on, on, on Facebook one time. Someone had posted something about like devising a new way to study martial arts. And you just wrote, congratulations on managing to ignore everything we've written about this for the last five years. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Quite an achievement. <laughs> it's, it's, it's frustrating. I mean, we all have a lot to do and you do not have as much time as you would want to have to read just everything that comes out. Nobody can do this. But um, we have been active now in the field for, for almost a decade. And before us, other people had been doing that stuff since the end of the 19th century. So there's a lot of good literature out there. And how can you ignore all that? Yeah. Like, we have to be, we have to be. <laughs> yeah. You used to say, you used to say, why do we have to go back to zero every time? Yes. <laughs> So that's why that's one of the reasons why I thought it was really important to start the journal martial arts studies yes. and to try and stimulate book publication that's yes. accessible and because people are just but this happened this 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 is not just like non-academics it's not just the case of like oh aren't non-academics like lazy because they don't buy books or anything mm. but actually you know I as a professor I get sent a lot of journal articles to mm. review and nine times out of ten, I'm saying, why didn't they just carry out a literature review mm. to mm. see what people had thought and yeah. argued and said and shown yeah. about? It? And the academics don't do it. They just go, oh, they'll wake up one day and go, I think I'll write about <laughs> uh, karate or judo yeah. or tai chi. Like, it's a new idea. Yeah. It happened. It's, it, it's, it's bizarre, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a pity. And I mean, usually when you start, uh, when you teach a university course, this is one of the first things that you that you would teach beginners. Just look it up. This is part. This is part of your job. I don't know why it's why it's not done. It's yeah. it's so odd. It I it miss. I mean, ah, I, I understand. There's some things that I do understand. Like, for instance, uh, a, a professor once came to Cardiff to give a talk about the the Ip Man films. You know, it was this at the time when there was only about five Ip Man mm. films, and now there's about twenty five or something. But um. And, and he, he'd give his talk and I said, but have you read and have you read? And I wrote and did you? And he said, no, I, what I wanted to do was just watch the films and think about what I thought first. Mm -hmm. 
but I know I will have to go and mm. so, but I, he didn't want to like mess up his thinking by mm. having it cluttered up with other people's arguments mm. first and I understand that I mm. understand that because sometimes taking that time to actually do the re, to read other people's articles it can snuff out the flame of your interest mm. before but there's no excuse for committing to paper yeah. before doing but that. then I mean simple you, you can do that but then it's too early to put it out yeah, yeah. Then why are you having the uh, the, uh, the presentation already? Yeah. Then well, you're right. It is to his credit. He said, please, like I said, can I record this? He said, no, because this is literally okay. me thinking yeah. and all things about. He wanted yeah. it to be more like a seminar, but yeah. But yeah. You would never do that. Six Vetslow would never do this. Uh, I almost did in Trier. <laughs> oh, in Trier, that was that yeah. was uh, that was Trier a great was a, Trier was a different thing when I talked about the sword and what the sword could mean and yeah. but I, I said it at the very beginning like this is this is not what I would usually what I would usually yeah. do the other thing that I always remember when I think about you is after a conference in Cardiff and we'd been out and all the bars had shut there was literally nowhere else to go and we went back to the student accommodation where we were staying and I, I'd had a few maybe a couple of beers maybe one or two and and I was we were sitting around a table and, and I was going out having a really serious conversation mm -hmm. with you and saying how I really liked unarmed uh, combat, but I wasn't really, I didn't like knives and I didn't, and, and, and you start quoting from Conan the Barbarian, he's like, ah, son, you must learn the riddle of steel. <laughs> <laughs> you must solve the riddle of steel. That's and then you went on several years later to, to give um, the paper at a conference in Trier called, like, re was it re revisiting the riddle of steel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or oh, reconsidering the, the <laughs> riddle of steel. Yeah, yeah. So tell us the riddle of steel and tell us the solution to the riddle of steel. Uh, I'm still working on the solution to the riddle of steel. The riddle of steel, okay, of course, in the, in the movie means something completely different. But for me, the riddle of steel, what I mean with it is why are people fascinated with swords, mm -hmm. with blades in general, but what makes the fascination of a sword as an object? Mm -hmm. This is, this in my job, this is the riddle of steel. Yeah. <laughs> um, because I, I see that... In, of course, in the reaction of the visitors that come to the museum. Now, not everyone, but many people have that, that fascination, sometimes also horror yeah, uh, for the sword, but it is, of course, obviously something that, that resonates um, within people. Yeah? And there has been such a dominant symbol in human culture, like every, every culture that, that was able to produce swords mm -hmm. used it as a, as a core symbol in their in their alphabet of symbolic meanings, yeah. mm -hmm. um, and it's it is the sword. Usually, it's the sword. Uh, it's not the battle axe. It's not the spear. Even though the spear is probably more important uh, in military history than the sword, yeah. Mm -hmm. But it is the sword that draws this attention, uh, and mm. this is this is what I've been wondering. This is for me the riddle of steel, and um, yeah, what I'm I'm trying to to solve. Yeah. I mean, with that, we've got. Uh, there were people at the conference in Trier who kind of who did challenge you on your claim that it is a such an almost kind of quasi universal mm. symbol of, of, of something of some kind of potency mm. and power and and, uh, and terror as mm. well, or shock and awe and terror. Mm. Yeah. Um, and people queried that, but but uh, uh, basing it on the anthropological possibility of of cultures without metal mm. yeah. but you you answered how did you answer that again um they were they were right like i i don't mean it as a universal uh, symbol i'm i'm not a jung jung i don't know how to sell it is jungian, jungian um, scholar so i do not believe that this is an archetype that is embedded em, uh, embedded somewhere deep down in our collective consciousness blah 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 i think that in a culture where you have the sword yeah. it attracts uh, all these these symbolic meanings yeah mm. and this is something that you can see in like any culture of course if you have a culture that do not have swords does not have swords maybe they will use another symbol yeah maybe they will use their war club or the puddle or, or an axe or something yeah that might be yeah? i'm also I'm, I'm not too well studied in 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 these these kind of cultures uh, i'm dealing with obviously mostly metal blades metal producing cultures but what I meant is, wherever you find the sword, it attracts these meanings. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I've been see on my, oh, what's this? Oh, I've got that alert for my next meeting, which I will be late for, I think. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm having too much fun. 
Yeah, in my undergraduate teaching um, this semester, there was we, we were looking at um, a lot of psychoanalytic theories around the body. And a really a big one was Julia Kristeva's notion of abjection. Now, you may not have touched that, but because when we were in Trier, I was talking about a book called The Psychoanalyst, Psychoanalysis of Fire by, yeah. know, by Blanchot or someone, I can't remember who it was by. Um, but Julia Kristeva's notion of abjection, and it's, it's the abjection, it relates to that which divides the inside from the outside mm -hmm. or, or, or shows us the, the, like the ultimate kind of abject object is the corpse. It's, it, mm -hmm. it kind of fascinates and revolts us. And I guess the sword isn't the ultimate object of going inside where it shouldn't be yeah. and also <laughs> bringing that inside outside in yeah. ways that we just, we want that boundary policed, you know, we don't, yeah. want, we don't want our innards oozing yeah. out. We don't want metal in our body. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is one I think of the reasons why it is such a such a fascinating object um, because it's it's almost metaphysical. Yeah, yeah. You, you're talking about about bound, um, uh, boundaries. So how small is the boundary? Yeah, my, here's my skin, uh, the inside, the outside. Yeah, it's it's a very thin layer, and the sword in itself with the edge, the edge is like this as well. It gets smaller and smaller and smaller, but getting smaller and smaller. It has the power to shape and create reality and to separate things that were one before, yeah? you mm -hmm. cut them, now suddenly they are two. Yeah? It's like magic, you create reality. And it's, it's able to pierce, yeah? to disrupt this boundary of inside and outside. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And by, by piercing something, yeah? and this is also like a metaphysical thing maybe about martial arts, mm -hmm. it condenses time and space. Yeah? Mm -hmm because it's only about that one point in time and one point in space. So will the weapon pierce your skin or not? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everything is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. whole reality is condensed into that one thing. And I think this is also one that we in some way intuitively um, understand. Yeah? Mm. And also I was very thankful for your, for your um, hint on that um, um, text on, on fire, psychology yeah. of fire. Because this is a very practical, not so metaphysical, <laughs> but very practical reason. When, when um, people cut themselves for the first time as a kid, they learn to fear the blade, they learn to understand the blade, and they uh, inten um, intentionalize this fear, like the fear of fire yeah, mm -hmm. or of a hot oven. Yeah. This, and this is something that stays with them. Once you've been cut for the first time, people are afraid of the knife, of the sword. Yeah. You know, when you threaten and they are afraid differently than they would be from a club yeah, or, yeah. or another weapon. Yeah, I guess this relate, this probably relates to because I think that that night sitting around the table when you proposed to me that I really did need to solve the riddle of steel. Um, <laughs> I think the point one of the points I may have been making was I really love wooden weapons. Yeah, because I think until you really get them moving, they're safe. Like, uh, uh, then they feel lovely. The, the, the texture of, uh, yeah. I love, I have lots of wooden weapons and I train with them and they feel like they're good for my limbs and they're good yeah. for my, my joint mobility and my strength. You can get a nice safe-ish workout with yeah. them. And it's really only when you get them in motion. And when they're yeah. in motion, they're beautiful, but they're still not necessarily deadly in the way yeah. that being gently grazed by a sharp knife is deadly. Yeah. I mean, do you, you, I know that you like wooden weapons too. I mean, yeah. you, 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 I guess you, you say that you've been doing a lot of quarter staff training at the moment, which is, which, which I really approve of because yeah. it's a wonderful weapon. Um, I mean, how, what's your relationship with the two sorts of weapons? Do you make a distinction when you're training? Um, the dis distinction is mainly, um, as of obviously you do it for safety reasons, also when you, when you train with a partner. Um, but again, it's um, a psychological um, uh, difference and that is that is huge yeah and this is uh, something that I'm also also interested in um, as, a, as a museum guy um, and that we should also look at in martial arts studies this is from our perspective I think an under-researched field the object what does the object do with the the body and the mind of the pr pr practitioner yeah mm -hmm. um, Somewhere, somewhat quoting Ben Spatz, what a, what a body can do. Um, my talk in Trier was called, um, what can a sword do or something yeah. like, <laughs> like this. Yeah. So the wooden weapon, if you, if you um, start to teach um, people in Filipino martial arts, for example, and you give them a wooden knife and you give them a drill with a knife, 
and then they move and at some point they do it fast but for them it's it's still it's a game mm -hmm. and then you give them when they are skillful with the drill you give them a sharp knife you do the same and suddenly ooh, they do it slow they are afraid of the metal themselves uh, so the reaction of us to the to the steel is obviously is different you know? yeah. this is this is a, a matter of being used to something of course, too. Yeah, if you do it then with a sharp, with a sharp knife, with a live plate, all the time, maybe you get used to it until you cut yourself. Yes. <laughs> and then, then you're getting careful again. Yeah. yeah. And the if you look once again, if we look at historical sources. There's there's different approaches to that. Uh, also in the history of of European martial arts, yeah, there are some Italian masters who would say, no, 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 you should always train with the sharp because otherwise it's just playing and you will never learn. And others say. Uh, no, you should train, of course, with dull training weapons because yeah. you would you would kill yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the, I guess you're you are because um, you're someone who will have a go at anything. You like you you just you just like to you're quite playful in your in a in a lot of your approaches to to the physical stuff and interacting yeah. with a partner and so on. I guess you're of the school where you train with everything and you train in every way: hard, soft, slow, fast intensity lightheartedly because yeah. i guess you want you just want to kind of live it and it to become natural in every circumstance Is that yeah right? yeah absolutely i mean it's um i don't go to to unfortunately i don't go to to dance classes regularly i'm not dancing tango or anything uh, i'm not doing other kinds of sports so this is this is my my physical output yeah and this is something that is beautiful about martial arts i think that can be it can be anything it can be your personal workout it can be hard, tough sparring, but it can also be kind of dancing and thus communicating um, with other people. Um, I think that it's that is important for me. It is important uh, to train like this because it keeps your motivation in yeah? mm -hmm. various ways. Um, it reflects the martial arts on my life. Probably today I should do a hard training, but I don't feel like it. Maybe it's a good day not to do a hard, hard training yeah. uh, and I also think that um, to become really proficient um, in the long term as a martial artist you should have these different levels mm -hmm. this is my approach yeah it was that was fascinating for me when I, for the first time when I was when I was doing ancient karate and we we prepared for the comp competitions we were always doing like hardcore sparring you yeah? know sparring was so painful and then I saw a training video of Andy Hook, the great Andy Hook, the, the K1 champion. Mm -hmm. And when they were doing sparring, it looked like, like play fighting. Yeah. Yeah? They were super soft and I was impressed. And I was like, he's one of the top fighters on the world. Maybe it's a good way to train like this as well. Mm -hmm. And in Pekitatesha, we have all these different levels. And I always have the, the quote from, from um, Leo Gahe in my head, like play with it. Yeah. yeah, gives you some methods, and now now play with it. Play with it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Doctor Sixt Wetzler, uh, I think we both need to get back to work today. Uh, unfortunately, so <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would. Yeah, it would be great to talk to you for ages. I'll talk to you again sometime soon. But for now, um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Paul. That was fun. <laughs>